Okay. Uh, hello and good morning to all. Uh, very warm welcome to, to all of you from my side and also from the Future U team. Uh, I'm Victor and this is Kira, uh, also a member of the Future U team, and we will be moderating this first semifinal. Uh, so this is the third edition of the Future Year competition, a competition that engages students in a visionary thought experiment about the challenges of the, of the European Union. Uh, it is also the second edition we do in person, and we are very excited to host this year again so many students from Civica universities in Berlin, and in particular during this amazing spring weekend. Yeah, before we actually start, we also want to take this opportunity to celebrate your successes. You made it to the semi-final, and that's a huge step. Your policy briefs were among the eight best of 72 submissions. So I think that's a huge round of congratulations to all of you. So this morning, during our first semi-final, four of the eight best teams will present their visionary ideas on how the EU can advance climate protection and sustainability policies in a turbulent world. We are very excited that we are joined for these semifinals by students from the Observer track. Ten students from Ukraine traveled to Berlin to be part of this experience. And last but not least, now it is my pleasure to introduce our fantastic panel of judges. Uh, for this first semi-final of the Future Year competition. We are honored to be joined here today by our judges uh, Lizia Wobsin, uh, Lucas Yer, and Philip Yega, policy fellows at the Jack Delors Center. Please give them a warm welcome. <laughs> and now we are truly about to begin the semi-finals. Again, eight minutes presentations and five minutes questions. And now we have the pleasure to listen to the first semi-finalist team of the Future EU competition, Team 86. I would like to invite Justine, Thomas and Simon from Bocconi University to please take the stage and present their proposal. Good morning, everyone. Uh, dear guests, dear jury, dear future team, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Thomas. Uh, sorry, I think there's a... ah, I'm sorry about that. Thomas. I'm Simon. Yeah. Uh, and I'm Justine. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, listening to us today. We're Team 86 and we're going to present on uh, next-gen agriculture, how to unlock the potential of flexible state aid. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to uh, get us started with why we chose the subject of agriculture. So we basically identified three main uh, issues that the agricultural sector is facing. The first one being reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, because they represent 10.3% of global EU emissions. Um, and of course, we can see that they, um, they, represent, uh, they, present, they represent a big part of them uh, and uh, they're part of an ambitious goal uh, of the EU to reduce those. Um, as you can see uh, on this graph, they're still uh, really important and they are stagnating uh, since the start of the... They have been doing so since the start of the 2000s. Um, the second uh, issue that we identified is, the, uh, is building resilience uh, against climate change, as this uh, will really impact agricultural productivity everywhere in Europe. What's important to understand is that those large variations uh, 
across Europe will particularly impact Western and Southern countries. So there's really a need for European cooperation to target this issue altogether. As you can see here on this map, it's not really a matter of borders uh, because in the end, most of European agriculture will be impacted. The last point uh, is the importance of protecting employment and social justice, as 4.5% of EU workers are in agriculture. There's also a rural-urban wage gap uh, that is really problematic since uh, it really uh, puts the, a lot of economic burden on uh, ag agricultures. Uh, therefore, there's really a need for a socially just transition and sustainable agricultural jobs. Small farms are especially... Um, uh, in, uh, in trouble in this situation because they cannot finance the transition alone. Therefore, as you can see on this map, um, there's really uh, a need for the EU to intervene as agricultural employment is spread unevenly across and within member states. So, um, as Justine said, um, farmers, they need financing, they need public financing. And there's already a system that exists, but we believe that it's inadequate. Why? So first of all, how does it work today? It's a bit complicated, a lot of EU acronyms, but basically you have the Common Agricultural Policy, which uh, mostly finances agriculture through the European Agricultural Guarantee Fund, which is mostly in income support, so it doesn't invest in anything. We're more interested in the European Agriculture Fund for Rural Development, which invests in projects, uh, in agricultural projects throughout Europe. But they have to respect a list of strict requirements, uh, and they also have to be part of member states' rural development plans, which are drafted every seven years, uh, at the same time as the EU budget. So it's not very flexible. And then you have state aid, which as a general rule is banned in the EU, but here we have some exception from this agricultural block exemption regulation, which allows state aid, but only for projects that are already allowed by uh, the EAFRD. Uh, so it's only like an additional support for things that are already partly supported by the EU. And we think that's a problem because there's a lot of sustainable investments and practices that do not fit all of these requirements that could benefit farms, and they cannot because they can't be financed because of the rigidity of the rules that has to wait seven years to change and the strict requirements of the EAFRD. And what are these strict requirements? A bit more precisely is that every project to be financed, it needs to address four of these six priorities. And we believe that the last two are actually the most important ones by far to tackle the EU's most pressing goals. Uh, they're one about resource efficient, climate resilient economy. Uh, and one about social inclusion and economic development. And the topic of a socially just transition, we believe these are two main priorities. The issue is that this can only finance quite broad projects and there are some simple innovations that cannot be financed because of that. So we think that the EU needs to be more flexible uh, and more targeted when it comes to financing agricultural investments. How can they do that? Uh, there's several ways. You could reform the uh, climate, energy, and environmental aid guidelines, uh, which is another law that basically allows state aid to finance the green transition. The problem is that it explicitly excludes agriculture for now. And so to include agriculture now would be a bit counterintuitive and um, politically a bit complicated to justify going against the law's original meaning. You could reform the common agricultural policy, but for that you need to wait until 2027, which is just three years before the deadline of Fit for 55, so we don't have time for that. Uh, you could create an ad hoc EU instrument that could be very flexible and tackle exactly what we want, but you would need to make it fit within the current EU budget or wait until 2027. So there's another way. You could amend the agricultural block exemption regulation that we mentioned before uh, to add an extra clause. We recommend the addition of a clause that would allow state aid to finance new projects that respect uh, only criteria five and six, so about climate and social justice, and that can be new and they don't, wouldn't need to be in these uh, rural development plans. We think it's the best way to go because it's flexible through state aid, which member states can adapt more rapidly. Uh, it follows the idea of the legislation in place. It solely expands it to target the EU's goals. And yeah, it targets investments towards the EU's most pressing goals. Well, here's a timeline to give you an idea of the implementation uh, of, our, of our recommendation. Um, so it involves a technicality, which is um, the amendment to uh, the Commission regulation that is written here on the board. After this step, uh, states will be able to finance a lot of interesting projects and innovative ones. And this will bring 
thanks to the flexibility, uh, the, um, a manner to target the urgency of climate change. Um, the end goal would be a burden relief, so that burden is shared equally um, among the different stakeholders and does not rely only on small farmers, for instance. In terms of feasibility, uh, we think that there's a real policy window for our proposal uh, because there are lots of uh, dialogues and debates around the question of member states financing uh, those kind of uh, projects for the green transition, especially at the European Council. Um, it was following the USA's Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we also cannot wait for the 2027 CAP negotiations. It's just too long, so we think that change needs to happen now. So, our proposal faces several challenges. First, about political feasibility. Uh, it's possible that all new practices might not be welcomed locally by all uh, stakeholders if all conditions to foster local support uh, are not met. Then, concerning availability of technologies, there is a potential lack of adequate technologies and supply chain issues that we need to address. And finally, if some countries support their agriculture more than others in a way that gives their farms uh, market power, it could be uh, an issue. How we tend to, to address these issues? Um, first, we think that um, respecting priority six would mean opening a social, a social dialogue that would allow to gather opinion from uh, EU citizens and foster local support. Then there are um, other many um, EU projects that support the research and development stage and the supply chain. And also we think that increasing financing would increase demand, which would then trigger uh, medium-term improvements. And then for potential market distortions, uh, investment themselves do not target uh, productivity, but rather the negative externalities generated by agriculture. And therefore we think that these investments improving sustainability will mostly not directly affect the prices that farmers uh, could sell their products at. Um, then. We wanted to uh, underline several strengths of our proposal. It is technologically neutral, it is flexible, it is targeted on, EU, uh, on Europe's priorities, it is an immediate response, and we think it is a quickly actionable uh, tool due to the political and uh, legal context. Thank you for your attention, and we'll be glad to answer your questions. Okay, now we have the, the time for the judges uh, to ask two questions. And uh, I would like to uh, reinforce to the teams to observe the eight minute time. Uh, thanks a lot for an inspiring policy brief and also an inspiring presentation. I have um, one question which is a rather general question. I really like that you thought through how to actually administratively implement your policy idea, but I was really wondering, so the idea really is to buy flexibility, so that, but, but I was wondering whether you actually do that. So the idea is that you simply focus on two priorities and therefore increase flexibility, but in the policy Brief, you also just mentioned basically one example which would benefit from that flexibility. Could you just come up with a few more examples or do you have like specific projects in mind which would actually increase for, uh, benefit from this, the, relax, the relaxation of those assumptions? Thank you. Uh, so there's actually a lot of examples. Uh, if you want some examples, for example, you, have, um, you can change the feedstock of cows uh, and that reduces methane uh, emissions, uh, but that is an environmental thing, and socially it's good because it's going to maintain the revenue of the farmers. But the other four priorities, they're they're very broad. Some are about knowledge transfer. Some are we can go back. Uh, so it's about competitiveness, knowledge, innovation, risk management, uh, ecosystems, and we think that these are important, but they're not necessarily the core priorities of the EU. And so there's many more innovations. So this one I just mentioned, uh, there's now new technologies about having uh, moving roofs over plantations in the south of Europe uh, so that they get a bit less sun and you can adapt them. Uh, you can have different sensors that you put in the ground uh, that are quite expensive, but then they're able to monitor very precisely how much water every plant needs uh, so that you use less water and um, you have a more sustainable farm. Uh, you can have you have different agricultural robots that can be a bit more efficient uh, than humans for certain tasks. 
Um, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of innovation to reduce the emissions. Uh, it's just that they're quite expensive and a lot of farms cannot afford it for now. Yeah. And so uh, I also mentioned other EU projects that already kind of support the research and, and development. And this is the case of the Horizon Europe, which is a fund supporting uh, research and development. And for example, I think that they, have, um, they are developing a, like a, a data sharing platform for agriculture uh, in Europe so that each farmer knows like how, what's happening around his agriculture lands. And uh, so we think that our proposal would then articulate quite in a relevant way with these proposals. I was just going to add maybe just co some concluded remarks, just saying that how our project would just um, make those innovations uh, also more available to farmers, uh, allowing states to like to finance for the research and to finance then for the distribution um, over their, uh, their countries, basically. Um, maybe we can uh, follow up with a second question. I like your slide on, on the different strengths that your proposal has, and I, I think I agree with them. But uh, one strength that doesn't uh, show is effectiveness. And so your proposal rests on making state aid more flexible, which um, yeah, would give uh, states uh, the ability to do something. But the question is also, is there appetite uh, from national governments to actually then do these uh, necessary investments? Um, well, um, I, uh, as we explained in the in the feasibility slide, uh, there's actually a climate for this kind of uh, flexibility to be implemented because there are lots of debates on different stages in different countries. So the, I'd say the main inspiration that started the debate was the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, to speed up the green transition. And there is actually debate at the EU level uh, to implement those changes and make them faster. And like one thing that's important to note is that it's the first time that you have actually every single member state that agrees that state aid should be, a bit, should be used uh, to finance the transition as long as it's targeted. And so that's why we insisted quite a lot on the targeting because even countries that usually are very against that, like the Netherlands, even now they're like, yes, we should use state aid just as long as it's targeted towards the real priorities that we have. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add uh, like a last point. We f we we acknowledge that there must be there will be a ch uh, heterogeneity because of course all countries do not have the same objectives in terms of uh, emission reductions. And for example, I think that countries that rely a lot on agriculture compared to others will are likely to be using state aids more than others because of course they have to support more their farms. But uh, overall, we think that considering the objective for. Uh, 2030 and 2050, we think that it could be a, definitely like a game changing tool for them to support. Okay, cool. Thank you very much <clears throat> for the uh, interesting policy brief. Also, uh, on my behalf, a quick question. You identify small farms as having trouble with financing. That's sort of your motivation. And um, my question would be how you would ensure that the increase in flexibility is not just enhancing the competitive uh, advantage of big farms over small farms, and how you would actually ensure that the increase in flexibility is targeted towards small farms. Thank you. Yeah, that's actually something that we discussed a lot uh, between us because we were a bit worried about it. And at first, we even thought of not doing this because it would finance just large farms. The thing is, if you take into account priorities five and six, the six is about social justice. And one thing that we noticed is that with, if you invest into the, in the sustainability uh, of plantations, of farms, you're not necessarily going to have an impact on the profitability of the farms because you're acting to reduce negative externalities but not necessarily to increase their productivity. And so maybe the larger farms, if they manage to get more state aid, they're going to be more sustainable. It doesn't mean they're going to be more profitable, so it doesn't mean they're going to get you know, any more market power or increase their competitiveness compared to the others. Thank you all, and we then proceed to the second semi-finalist team. I invite to the stage team 59, 
composed by Luca, Fabio, and Giovanni from Bocconi University to present their visionary idea. And I would like to stress that uh, we are timing the answer time. So as long as you're answering, the time is counting, and then we show the card, even though uh, the questions might uh, come uh, more than once after you, you start answering. So now, uh, welcome Team 59. Dear judges, dear colleagues, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, our policy brief is titled Leveraging Public Markets for Sustainable Growth, and I would like to introduce the idea behind it, um, starting from the uh, problem it aims to solve. We know that the green transition is becoming more and more urgent, but we also know that creating the projects that can sustain this development can be extremely expensive. And um, we, I'm talking about projects, for example, in the waste management sector or in the energy sector, that, as we can see from the slides, have, um, are extremely capital intensive. So what we propose is a way of accelerating this process by, um, by, uh, by allowing green projects to access larger capital on the public markets. This, uh, this would be bring, in very basic terms, more money into the sector, larger positive environmental impact, and um, most importantly, uh, more efficient capital allocation. And uh, to stress even more this necessity, we recognized on the, on the market side a strong rise in, uh, in interest in sustainable investing. And, uh, but, but at the same time, we believe that now an equity instrument that can let money flow efficiently into actually sustainable projects does not exist. And in particular, ESG funds that are by far the most common uh, instrument used in this field have proven to fail in differentiating impactful projects from non-impactful ones and resulting in, uh, in so-called green portfolios that are uh, often just uh, trackers of more traditional indices. And um, for all these reasons, we, we came up with a framework that allows the, the creation of a new trusted market for, um, thanks to the support of the European Investment Bank. And in designing this process, we focused on creating a win-to-win -win balance that can at the same time, um, uh, that can at the same time preserve the, the common interest and create lucrative opportunities for firms and private investors. And now I'll leave the floor to Giovanni, who is going to describe some important details of the idea, and then Fabio will walk us through some more operational details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. Um, so, we now understand what is wrong with the current status quo, and uh, we therefore propose a policy whose aim is overcoming the limitations that Luca just mentioned. Um, so, from the beginning, we understand that our approach must involve the European Investment Bank in the creation of an investment channel that allows environmentally focused projects to reach public markets. We understand how crucial it is to achieve an effective ecological transition, but such monumental efforts also need funding, and in the context of our proposal, this will be ensured. There are many potential pressure points because funds may not be used in an effective manner, and for example, guarantees on both the environmental and economical sustainability of the project uh, are to be required. And this brings us to one of the core pillars of our proposal. So why would the EU need to be involved? Well, we identified the need for an EU back procedure for various reasons. First of all, the EU is a public entity, so we will be able to fully internalize the social benefits that would originate from the project. And we would also aim, aim to not earn a profit. And this would result in much lower fees that are associated with the advisory process. EU involvement will also sponsor the project and bring it to the attention of institutional and private investors alike. Um, Moreover, the scrutiny would be performed by the European Investment Bank, which is an impartial entity. And this would ensure both the trustworthiness of the project and the aforementioned environmental and ecological uh, guarantees that would have to be provided. Uh, so we now understand why would the EU need to be involved, and we can now start to discuss uh, the various phases of the partnership, beginning from the selection. The selection is made uh, along three main lines. 
and these are the project's impact on the environment, which must be seen as a fundamental and binding attribute. Secondly, the project's profit aim, so the project should be able to generate a positive cash flow. It should be sustainable financially as well. And lastly, a pre-existing managerial structure should be present. Uh, following the selection, each project will become the first and initially the only focus of a new division of the parent company. This division would be subject to a carve-out, and this is a bit technical, but in basic terms, this means that um, the firm would uh, sell a minority stake of such division, and um, the latter, the division, would be able to access public markets, so to raise the extra funds it needs from outside investors. Hence, the parent company would still retain uh, some degree of ownership of the division, and uh, this basically uh, brings us to uh, the end of the project because what happens after the initial project has ended? Well, then the firm can either liquidate the division, so sell all the assets and repay all its liabilities, replicate uh, the project the business model in different contexts, or simply start fresh with a new project. And now I'll leave the floor to Fabio. Okay, so thank you everybody. Uh, I will now cover the more technical aspects of our proposal. We can see here, divided, we have divided them for clarity purposes in uh, three thematic areas. Uh, that you can see are tightly interconnected, but this is through a positive relation so that all incentives are aligned. And this is the key of why we proposed uh, such policy brief. Uh, so starting from the European Investment Bank, they would first need to create a new internal division with expertise in evaluating businesses and assessing their environmental impact, which they already have. Uh, the novel part they will need to develop is the capability to advise a carve-out, and uh, crucially they would screen projects based also on economic feasibility. Uh, so regarding the payment, they would receive the shares for this new carved-out division from the, the IPO or carve-out process. Now, let's move on to how we intend to make sure that these projects are truly sustainable. Again, a different screening, this time based on uh, sustainability, but crucially, we have thought of including a mandatory clause in the corporate governance of these new carved out firms, that is this uh, committee made uh, by members, all appointed by the European Investment Bank with the veto power over major decisions that could impact the policy, the environmental policy of the firm. And uh, crucially, both the European Investment Bank and Environmental Commitment will have an effect on the financial performance of the assets resulting from the, oper the operation, thanks to the advisory role and so the right pitching of the IPO to uh, have a good price to shares, but also thanks to this uh, novel approach that we developed called the distributive cash out strategy. So this is the first way for the European Investment Bank to cash out on their position, but they would do so by selling the shares that they owned at a discounted price uh, in the form of options to other existing shareholders. So this would be like a premium, uh, a benefit for the environmental commitment because the amount of shares to be sold would depend, would depend on whether the firm has reached or not some particular environmental goals that are assessed and assigned by the previously mentioned committee, which is, should be impartial as is appointed by the, the European Investment Bank. So yeah, to conclude, we summarized uh, in our table of benefits uh, what also has been said before. Uh, so we have benefits both for the firms with uh, higher capital. Uh, the idea is that thanks to our capital, in fact, we could improve uh, their efficiency and also uh, improve, therefore, the impact of the climate. And yeah, as we said, there are also benefits for all the other parties involved. Uh, thank you for the attention. Maybe just a small. Can you hear me? Yeah. Maybe just a small question to start. You you start off uh, saying that the uh, ESG criteria, the ESG funds, are basically too broad, right? They they, they are pretty similar to other indices. Um, how do you make sure that your instrument you're proposing is actually not in the end becoming too broad as well? How do you ensure that? Yes, we, we found some interesting research about this, um, this aspect. In fact, ESG funds have proven to be ineffective in differentiating these impactful projects from the non-impactful ones. And the difference in all this framework would be the, the scrutiny of the European Investment Bank. So the, um, uh, this entity, this public and impartial entity, uh, would, with, of course, 
um, expertise in environmental matters and as well in financial matters would um, would give an, an effective screening of the projects and therefore ensuring um, a positive impact for the environment and at the same time an economic feasibility of the whole process. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I really need to say that I have a very lay understanding of what you presented. And I also had to Google what a carve out actually is. So I probably also have a very lay question. But my question would be, um, so the way I understand it, that I could imagine that this setup or mechanism is likely to get exploited by firms in the sense that I could imagine that a lot of firms say, okay, let's do this small division and let's participate in this, I don't know how to call it, market. And, uh, and they could basically instrumentalize it in a way that they use it as a flagship um, project to basically greenwash themselves or to increase their sustainable image without having any lasting effect in the sense that they would only that they that they would only have like a very small division in it did you think about that or do you actually think this is a problem or not and if so how do you think about it thank you okay so thank you for the question obviously this greenwashing is a problem that we know of and we thought of uh, the idea is that uh, obviously the scrutiny by the European Investment Bank would be down to assess that only a certain number of projects uh, would in fact go through this uh, process, the more impactful one on the environment, since that is the, uh, the reason why we have proposed it. And so if the project is uh, just uh, um, how can I say, like a way to greenwash the image of the firm and it's not really impactful, then it would likely not go through, not be selected. At the same time, if it's a truly sustainable project done by a firm who is also trying to green, uh, to green wash and to clean its image, if the project is, uh, has a true impact, a true positive impact for the environment, well, it's likely to still go through, but we don't see this as a, a particularly negative side. Instead, like we see this, uh, we thought of uh, this process could also bring a good image to the firm as a, an incentive for them to actually commit, uh, to commit to proposing something that is, that is good. So again, uh, we think the incentives to actually do something good for the environment are again respected also because it uh, will be a benefit for them, on, not only on financial terms, but also on the, on the image, in fact, as you, as you said. So. Yes, I would like to, to add and clarify that, of course, uh, this greenwashing issue can be actually uh, a problem, but this scrutiny we thought of is, um, is, is broader, as Fabio was saying. Um, of course, the project would have a positive impact, so that's the, that's the key. Um, but also the firm, the parent firm, would, uh, would have a sort of control on, uh, would be controlled in a way by this um, by the European Investment Bank through the uh, also the, the the committee we decided to introduce in the uh, in the board of directors. Is there enough time for another question? Um, yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the for the great presentation. I learned a lot about uh, carve outs, and <laughs> like Alicia, I'm I'm not an expert on these things. Um, one thing that stuck out to me is whether the European Investment Bank is actually the right vehicle to do this. And so have you thought about how much bigger the European Investment Bank would need to be to fulfill this function? And do you really think that the uh, um, European Investment Bank is better suited to do this than um, private firms and banks um, if they have a firm set of regulations. So couldn't it be better to just have a strong set of rules in place and then let the market operate? Well, the problem with private banks, of course, is the, is the high cost of, this, uh, of the whole operation. Because, of course, this is something that can be done now, but um, it is not advantageous it is not advantageous enough for firms because, of course, um, doing an IPO can be very, very costly. So having this entity as, a, uh, as a, the main actor of the, of the whole process can guarantee uh, a cheaper vehicle for, uh, for, um, uh, for bringing these projects to, to the public markets. And uh, yeah, we also mentioned, uh, I think, in the first slide of Fabio's, um, the presence of the expertise, of the EIB expertise in both business relation and environmental impact analysis. So basically the only 
extra expertise that the EIB would need to actually earn would be about financial markets. So the, the point is also that the EIB is to some extent uh, already a knowledgeable entity, if we can say it. So uh, it would be suited also because of all the other uh, so-called entanglements that uh, occur between the EIB and both all the projects that it scans. Yeah, lastly, to add also, as Giovanni also said priorly, uh, the EIB involvement would actually sponsor the problem, the, the, the process in the sense that investor can have the guarantee that actually there is a respectable entity, an impartial entity that went through this um, the, the proposal for the, this division to be carved out and approved both the economic part and the environmental part. And these screenings are things that are already being done because now they, uh, they act kind of like a, a fund also with the European Investment Fund to invest in green sustainable projects. So yeah, the, as he, uh, Giovanni also said, the only part that we need to be added is this uh, capability to advise and uh, a carve out IPO. Uh, we also see it's not uh, as improbable to uh, maybe have some uh, collaboration with other uh, current private investment banks, which is uh, a way, only at the beginning, would be a way for them also to have this uh, positive image with this commitment to environmental goals, which is now really, ah, sorry, I didn't, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we could be a sharing of expertise at the beginning at least. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I would now like to invite Team 77 on, 77 on the stage. Um, Alexia Manon from LSE will present their idea. Dear members of the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs of the European Parliament, emissions in Europe are rising. Current EU policies, including one that was voted this Tuesday, address one side of this problem. They push airline companies to invest in low-carbon technologies. But we lack demand-side policies that will address the rise in air travel. Manon and I work for the Commission, and we're here to present a new policy which aims to embed social justice into the aviation fiscal framework to put a stop to the rise in air travel. In 2019, emissions from the European aviation sector were 34% higher than in 2005, only 14 years. Why? There are technological improvements, but they are being outpaced by the drastic rise in air travel. It almost doubled in those 14 years. And according to the industry's forecast, it's likely to continue. This raises serious concerns about the ability of the EU to effectively reduce its aviation carbon footprint and meet its climate targets. But there is another key element to the issue, inequalities. This graph represents the average individual carbon footprint of EU citizens per income group. On the left, the top 1% of the income distribution, and on the right, the bottom 50% and bottom 5% of the income distribution. The light yellow color represents air travel emissions. Inequalities are striking. An individual in the top 1% of the income distribution is responsible with air travel only for five times more emissions than the total carbon footprint of an individual in the bottom 50%. The, in, in the context of climate change that threatens everyone and more specifically the poorest, this sharp inequality raises serious concerns of justice. The EU must show leadership in addressing this very unfair rise in air travel. Um, so now Manon will talk you through existing policies and the gap we have identified. So um, 
today, uh, I mean, nowadays we have two main existing po supply side policies that exist in the EU. We have the EU ETS. So the EU ETS only covers flights within the European Economic Area. Um, and they uh, intend to phase out free allowances in, by 2026 for the aviation sector, which incentivizes them to reduce the carbon footprint and invest in new technologies. Um, to only the, the international flights are only covered by the Corsia, which is an offsetting mechanism, and, but there is a potential extension uh, for the EU ETS to international flights for the, uh, during the revision in 2026. Then we have the revision of the, another policy, which is the Energy Taxation Directive, which is a complementary mechanism of the EU ETS. Um, it's, uh, it puts a, a carbon tax on aviation fuel, and it's uh, for only for the aviation, uh, for intra-EU flights and domestic flights. It will maybe cover it as well uh, later on by 2026 for international flights. Um, these two policies are supply-side policies, and while it incentivizes them to um, shift toward low carbon solutions for the aviation sector and reduce the carbon footprint, um, they do not address this rise in demand for air travel. I will now pass on to you for our proposal. Thank you. So our proposal aims to fill this critical gap. It is called the Fair Mobility Pact because it pushes, um, it pushes frequent flyers to reduce their air travel consumption, while it creates a new revenue stream to invest in low carbon and affordable transportation. So the idea is simple. The more you fly, the higher the tax. Uh, more specifically, the tax rate depends on the amount of CO2 and non-CO2 impacts of the flights you've taken in a given year. The specific thresholds and tax rates will need to be widely discussed with all European stakeholders. Here we suggest uh, tax rates that range from 20 to 240 euros per tonne of CO2 equivalent in 2030. The tax will initially apply to all flights within the EU, but it could be extended from 2027 to all departing and arriving flights. In that case, the basis for uh, the tax calculation would be 50% of the CO2 and non-CO2 uh, impacts. This is an illustration of the tax burden for a frequent flyer. In 2030, his flights uh, correspond to nearly four tons of CO2 equivalent. As you see, for his first flight, the tax is quite low, but it increases rapidly. Now, the final amount of nearly 400 euro for one year might seem high or low, depending on your perspective. Here is the perspective we suggest. To respect the Paris Agreement and limit global warming to 1.5 degree, the average individual carbon footprint should be no more than 2.3 tons of CO2 equivalent. Now, the um, tax could, could raise approximately 15 billion euro per year. This is equivalent to 9% of the EU annual budget. High-income groups will be the main contributors to this revenue stream, since they are the ones who consume more flights. The revenues will be collected by member states and used along three priorities. First, rail infrastructure. Second, public transport subsidies for low-income groups. And third, uh, research and development in low-carbon aviation. To give some illustration, with 15 billion euro, we could every year finance 600 kilometers of high-speed rail infrastructure, or we could give train vouchers of more than 300 euro for all citizens in the, top, in the bottom 10% of the income distribution. Now Manon will talk you through the implementation challenges. So we have, we have three main uh, implementation challenges to, to uh, implement this tax. So first of all, we'll have to develop an infrastructure database uh, to connect individuals' ID with their previous flight purchases and their climate impacts. So we'll have to, uh, we, we, it, it will have to be GDPR compliant uh, in the data collection. Then we have as well uh, to develop a unique method to align CO2 and non-CO2 impacts because it's, it's really important in, for the aviation sector. Then we'll have to move on to a wide stakeholder consultation process because uh, as this tax is going to address uh, numerous stakeholders, first of all, the member states, uh, to set a minif minimum threshold tax, we'll have to do a consultation then with the aviation lobbies 
uh, which are a big lobby in the European Union, so we'll have to negotiate with them. And finally, uh, as well, evaluate the cost uh, of the, for the tourism of this tax, of this implementation tax. We have la one last fine uh, legal uh, point uh, where the Chicago Convention um, actually does not uh, put any barriers uh, to the implementation of this tax uh, because only um, because the, the Chicago Convention only bans the fuel stored on board, and so we don't see any barriers to that. Um, so to sum up, uh, we have an increasing rise in air travel emissions, uh, air travel and the emissions with them, um, but we only have supply side policies, and what we want uh, today is to regulate this demand, uh, to embed this notion of social justice. And, uh, and finally, um, we think our policy is feasible, politically, technically, and legally. Thank you very much for listening to us. Uh, thanks a lot for the great uh, presentation. Um, you already have a lot of questions on your second to last slide, and I actually wanted to, to ask you about uh, one particular aspect uh, on that. And uh, it seemed to me that you want that uh, airlines uh, collect the data, and then it seems it would be a little bit complicated to, if, if, uh, if one person flies uh, in a year with different airlines, how does the data get aggregated and how is it then transmitted to the uh, to the tax authorities. So do you have uh, something in mind how this could be, as you say, GDPR uh, uh, compliant? So, uh, oh yeah. uh, so what we thought about is, uh, so basically when you go to the US, you kind of like generate, you buy your ESTA, or when you, we, we thought about generating a number for every year, and th this is generated by a EU platform, which, is, which register your IDs, and so it's not for the aviation, it's not the airlines companies that collect them. And then on the website, we will have like a small case where you will put this number, which is a tax number, and then at the end, like progressively, it will adjust within the, with the airlines and the European uh, platform. I mean, the, uh, just to, to add something, the database would be a European database. And as she said, each airline company will uh, pick in, like, add, da add data into this database and use data from this database. Uh, but it would be uh, something common. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, yeah, I think your problem identification and also your policy solution are pretty clear. I fully agree. I do think that um, inequality in carbon footprints um, across different income levels are horrible and stunning, and I think it's really important to do something about that. I wouldn't fully agree with you that, for instance, tax on aviation fuel is actually a supply-side policy. I would also say it also has demand-side effects. But my question is actually rather similar to Philip's ones because I'm also um, mainly worried about the implementation of this policy. And I actually do think that it could be a bit more complicated than, than, than you thought through it in a sense because I really think that for instance within the Schengen area for instance we also have like the freedom of travel so you could actually or I could actually just fly from Berlin to Lisbon without even showing my ID card. So there actually, I actually think that it's really, really difficult to, traf, uh, to, to, um, um, to track um, the way people travel. And my second, I mean, that's basically the same question as Philip just asked, but I would really be interested how you think about that. Would that mean that people have to, make more, have to give more information if they fly? Do you think that li that's likely that people want that and also that member states of the European Union want that? And my second question would be a bit on the tax revenue generated. So you now said that the idea is to reinvest that, but would you like to happen that on the European level or do you think about some kind of redistribution me mechanism to the different member states or is each member state responsible of the tax revenue they generate? Do you have specific ideas about that? Thank you. Yes, thank you for your questions. So for, for the first one, yes, we assume that, I mean, one of the things we are going to have to argue when we push for this policy is that the, 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 we need to ask more information to people who use flights. All EU citizens, as you said, don't even have to show an ID, but we need, for, with this policy, we need a way to actually 
know who they are and link that to their carbon account in the, in the common database. So it does mean uh, quite a little bit of engineering. Uh, however, we think, I mean, it is totally possible. It's about, you know, adding, um, like, I mean, technically it's totally possible. Then, as you said, politically, is it going to be accepted? We believe the stakes are high and that we have uh, good arguments to push for that. And uh, then your other question on the revenues. So the idea is that member states will collect the revenues and member states will uh, then choose uh, how to use them, but it must be used along the three priorities we have mentioned. However, for example, we want to leave member states some flexibility. For example, we have mentioned rail infrastructure, and then I gave an example of uh, 600 kilometers of high-speed rail. Well, maybe high-speed rail is a priority in some places. Maybe in other places it's more proximity transportation that matters. So we, we want uh, member states and even like regions within member states to be able to make those choices. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your presentation, also on my behalf. I um, think it's really st striking, the inequalities, and rightly so, you mentioned solidarity as one of, as one of your main goals uh, with your policy. Uh, I'd be interested in uh, what you understand, what's your understanding of solidarity, and how you would think that your proposed uh, policy feeds into uh, that uh, fostering solidarity. So first of all, I think just to remember, I, the, the good thing about uh, implementing a new tax is that you really implement further the polluter pays principle. So as you pollute, you pay for it. We are, I'm, I'm, if I'm more privileged and I'm gonna get maybe more opportunities to travel, I have to pay for it. Um, on the notion and solidarity is that we have to do a redistribution of revenues um, horizontally and vertically, and to do that, uh, this kind of tax uh, makes it for me a bit more fair. And plus, just one more point: uh, the aviation is uh, sector is a bit of a symbol uh, in terms of climate justice and climate and carbon footprint uh, inequalities. And I think it's just a great example on how we can just do a bit more. Then I'm just going to ask a similar qu uh, question in a similar vein uh, to this. Um, I think uh, your proposal mixes kind of a, you know, a climate ambition with distributional questions. Um, and I was wondering, I mean, this is a difficult thing to do. And uh, do you have ideas in other spheres where uh, this approach could be, uh, could be uh, valuable besides air travel? Because uh, I feel like once we go down that road that we want that richer people pay more to uh, uh, yeah, and the, the polluter pays. Uh, are there perhaps more effective uh, areas, or do you think that air travel is really the one to go after? Um, yes, because indeed uh, we need to address air travel, but air travel is not everything, and uh, even if the inequalities are striking. Um, I believe uh, air travel is uh, a specific sector where um, the, in the inequalities are the most striking and where this policy could be, I guess it could be the first step. Now we thought also about other sectors like um, in the building sector. So when you want to hit yourself and you pay a tax on it, this is very uh, uh, the actuality. Uh, we could imagine that the amount of the electricity or gas, the, 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 sorry, the amount you pay for that depends not only on how much you consume, but also depends on how much you consume relative to the size of your apartment, how many people live in it, how much you earn. So basically saying that if I am the mother of a family with five children living in a small apartment that is poorly isolated in Paris, the amount per kilowatt hour should not be the same than someone who lives by himself in a huge apartment that is, uh, you know, th that's uh, another uh, field uh, where we could implement this kind of perspective.
thank you, Alexia Manon. And finally, uh, last but not least, for this first semifinal, I would like to invite the fourth semifinalist team, I invite Giacomo, Luca, and Martino, students at Bocconi University, uh, Team 41, to present their ideas. Good morning, everybody. We are Team 41, and we are here to present you our policy brief called Saving the Planet on a Friday Off, using the four-day work week as a tool for EU climate policy. The EU is uh, at the forefront in climate action and aims to become the first continent uh, which is climate neutral by 2050. While the cornerstone of the energy transition is achieving full clean energy production, the recent war in Ukraine shifts the focus to the other side of the market because the energy crisis made it a necessity to decrease our energy consumption. But uh, uh, compressing energy demand is highly unpopular, especially with the working class, rural inhabitants, and commuters. The four-day work week would allow us to reach substantial savings in energy consumption without reducing our welfare. Actually, we are here to show you that it could increase uh, everybody's well-being. So why the four-day work week? First of all, environmental benefits, which are almost self-explanatory. For one more day, offices would stay closed and people wouldn't have to go to work. This would bring uh, significant energy savings in corporate buildings and reduce pollution by commuting. Estimates of national effects of a 20% working hour reduction range from a 10.5% saving in energy use by Q2021 to a 24% savings in emission by Xala in 2020. And crucially, in infrastructurally disadvantaged territories are those where commuting is more harmful and costly, so are those who have most to gain from our, from our policy. We know that uh, if uh, um, people start to hop on the first plane on their Friday off, some of this benefit could be loose, but we are in a period of growing common environmental consciousness, which we believe would help. Indeed, uh, evidence shows that uh, uh, many people become more and more mindful of their sustainable habits and of their ecological footprint. And more evidence shows the beneficial effect of having more free time. And that, uh, for example, people would uh, use their longer weekend for low um, emission activities, such as uh, working, um, staying with the family, cooking, or volunteering. The main point is having more free time would allow us to take ownership of our consumption choices because at home, it is us who pay the bills. And uh, this more free time would help us capitalize on this increasing common consciousness. Beyond climate gains, the second main consequence of the four days work week is in the realm of workers' well-being, achieving lower stress level and a healthier life balance. Indeed, um, the, uh, as we know, the pandemic put us in front of an historical moment for our labor markets. Uh, workers are now shifting their priorities and the working culture is shifting altogether. Indeed, uh, worker priorities are no more the same as they are now no more willing to put work needs in front of life needs. The uh, four-day work week indeed would give uh, kind of an answer to these new renewed demands of people uh, trying to switch their work as uh, we saw with the great resignation movement because of their new necessities being a healthier work-life balance but also um, being giving new importance to their mental well-being and also more flexibility arrangement in their job positions. 
and all these voices that raised during the great resignation movement that we saw uh, in US but also here in Europe uh, voiced this alarming scenario that we can grasp looking at these two graphs. The burnout uh, graph on the left shows a box plot of uh, uh, close to burnout uh, uh, feelings that uh, our employees experienced across different European workplaces and as you can see the median level is around 50 50%. That is, one out of two uh, workers in Europe felt this huge emotional distress during their whole working life at least once. Even the right work graph uh, plots the, another alarming situation, uh, uh, giving us a uh, 35 percentage average of stressful moments experienced by uh, our workers in the day prior to the survey administration. And so why the four day work week would allow to respond to these new working attitudes? Because evidence showed in pilots and in trials, as the UK uh, results here reported, uh, show us that this trial, uh, participants in this trial report less stress, fatigue, and anxiety and burnout levels than before. And even more, uh, the, uh, not only the well being, the mental well being would increase, but even the, the four day work with would even allow us to materialize the new condition for a more even sharing of housework and caring responsibilities within the household, as you can see from the two uh, columns on the right word part of the graph. And uh, thus, harmony between work and family would increase, fostering a transition toward more progressive gender norms paramount in achieving the shrinkage of any gender gap. So why haven't we done it already? We haven't because make such programs economically sustainable is very difficult. The point is that productivity has to increase. And it's very easy to see why. If we keep productivity fixed and we just work less, we're going to produce less and consume less, which is nothing else than a recession. The only way to being able to work less without reducing our consumption levels is if we increase our hourly productivity. The point is that the problem is that there is no one-stop shop for productivity growth, especially since we're not talking here about introducing an, a technological innovation that simply makes production more efficient. We're, we're talking about a purely organizational reform that requires pure organizational changes. And firms are, are not made equal in organizational standpoints. Every firm is different, and every firm need, needs to find their own way to achieve productivity growth. And not all firms are uh, equally equipped to do it. Smaller and knowledge-intensive firms have been found to be more prone to flexible change and to change the, the, their arrangement of organizations. So how are firms in trials holding up? Turns out they're doing wonderfully. Firms in the UK trial uh, achieved 35% increase in the revenue growth with respect to a comparison period, which becomes 37% in the US and Ireland, while Microsoft Japan was able to measure productivity and reported a staggering 40% increase in individual productivity over the trial period. Still, we ca absolutely cannot know if other firms would do the same. The problem is that firms self-select into trials, so the better equipped for firms are disproportionately represented in trials. The only way to know if sustainable working hour reductions are sustainable across our economies is if we hold bigger trials, more trials that specifically target the firms that would not themselves choose to participate. We call European, that's why we call European members of parliament to propose a continental trial of the four day work week with the following characteristics. It needs to be sponsored by the EU Commission. It needs to provide crucial financial insurance against productivity losses. It needs to target multinational corporations which are big and stratified and reluctant to enter these trials. It will need to be diffused throughout the internal market uh, to plant the seed of this policy throughout the member states. And it needs to target infrastructurally disadvantaged areas which are the ones that have the most to gain because their commuting is more harmful and costly. To wrap up, we think the four days work week is at the crossroads of three historical challenges of our time, which are meeting our emissions goals through emission reductions, closing the divide between popular classes and climate policy, and achieving a labor market that prioritizes workers' well-being. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, thank you very much for an inspiring presentation. And I really do think it solves, well, you aim at solving two of the most important pressing issues. We're emitting too much emissions and we're all working too much. Um, maybe uh, quickly, uh, you imply that less stress leads to less emissions, um, which I find is an interesting thought. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that, how less stress in the workplace leads to less emissions? It's, it's not really an implication, it's nothing causal here, it's just two correlations. So basically we have less stress or so more well, mental well-being from the low, let's say, social part of this policy. So the reform would allow us to yeah, achieve a higher mental health uh, since people are working less and are they having one, day, one extra day of weekend, so time more to spend with their family, with loved ones, and, and to engage with the activities that they like to do extra office. On the other hand, also having a day extra the office, so out of the office more, would allow us to not go to the office and the office stay closed. So two, to, to, let's say, channels of remission reductions in this part which are the savings from the office side so the firm level but also the individual level which doesn't have to commute an extra day and so saves also on that part of the emissions to go to work and on the other side as we mentioned staying house should also enhance this transition toward more uh, environmental self-conscious attitudes that we experience since the pandemic uh, nowadays Aside from that, another point is that um, having more free time, if, if we're not free to choose what to do with our consumption, we cannot be mindful in our ecological footprint. Uh, so the, the d demand side policies kind of do don't work if we, if we cannot freely choose what to consume. Having more free time gives us some ownership more some extra ownership of our consumption choices and that can can be the only way through which we can truly capitalize on new ecologically mindful attitudes and so that's straightly linked to stress it's just a consequence not uh, an implication um. Yes, thank you for answering that question. I also have a question, and uh, my question is really, I really like this idea to have, like, to have a Europe European-wide trial on a large scale, which allows to assess um, those effects across a wide range of populations, basically. And I was just thinking, let's assume the trial already happened, and the, uh, the results uh, very in favor of this policy. So you find positive effects across all dimensions you're interested in. I still think that it would actually be really difficult to implement that in a sense that I do think that the five days week is really fundamentally embedded in our working culture and the way we think about it. And there's also like this um, famous um, quote by John Maynard Keynes, you probably also read that you already predicted in the 1930s that in 100 years time, which is basically now, people will only work 15 hours a week, which didn't happen, even though we had productivity gains over that, these 100 years, and it would, in principle, be possible to, to create society, or to, to design society in a way that that would be possible. So do you have any thoughts about like this, this or, or do you see signs that this idea about how work should be structured is actually changing across generations and also across time, or do you? Yeah, how do you think about that? Yeah, we think cultural transformation is possible and the great resignation is a big sign of this. But furthermore, on the sustainability side, 20 years ago, almost nobody was thinking about the level of emissions uh, everybody was uh, emitting. So we think with strong enough push and uh, such trials uh, could be part of the evidence for this push people can change. Furthermore, in Italy there has been recently a pool where 70% of, of employees were positive and about the four days working week saying that would like to go toward that direction. And, uh, of course, it's easy to, 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 to see that workers want to work less. It's very difficult to see that firms want their workers to work less. Uh, 
but if trials are, if results are, are, are in, in encouraging, I think there will also start to be some, some competition on working, on positive working conditions. So firms starting to compete for workers using working conditions as a tool. So if, if this is sustainable, more firms could try to do it and, and workers would flock to those firms. Uh, to complement also our instrument would stress even more those that would not self-select into the trials as happened already. So if all those that already had positive effects continue to maintain this working structure and even those ones that should not do like have this positive uh, implication uh, uh, by ex-ante uh, foreseeing uh, should uh, actually have positive effects so increasing productivity and so on and so forth then why not maintaining it as a cultural way? I mean, if also the multinational ones could in, be informed about how are their productivity increasing and make, capitalizing on, on such a working culture, then probably even their push toward more consumption, toward greater sales and, and, uh, and uh, revenue growth would uh, let them uh, stick to this plan. Okay, great. Um, I have a question that's a bit more technical and about the implementation. Uh, in your presentation, you said that uh, insurance against productivity losses is a, is a key part of your proposal. I wanted to challenge that a little bit and ask, is this really needed? And if yes, who's going to pay for it? It is really needed because firms are scared that they will lose revenue. And, and to convince the reluctance, insurance against productivity losses, we find it's, it's needed. And we thought about financial um, leverages on uh, financial paths through the European Social Fund Plus and the European uh, Fund for Regional Development because we, wanted, we want to target infrastructurally disadvantaged areas. So we, we, we think it might be the case to put EU funds on the line. Furthermore, if it ends up that it's not needed, it's just money saved. They, they would not uh, give this money if it's not. Productivity increases. Yeah. It, it's probably going to be quite difficult to assess whether the productivity loss is due to the trial or due to other things, but uh, I think that's for, for a different discussion. That actually already concludes our first semi-final. Thank you to all of you who presented already. I think we had really interesting ideas and I'm really curious as well to see what the other semi-final will bring for us. Um, with that now, we um, send the judges off to decide on their first uh, finalist. We will hear about the finalists later at the end of the second semi-final. But to already spoil you a bit, um, for the like for the ongoing semifinals, we have an idea which is or an award which is proposed, which is called the Public Choice Award. And you, semifinalists and also the observatory students, we want to invite you to also judge on your own favorite policy proposals. So you can already start thinking now who did you like the best already, and then after the second semifinal, you will vote on your favorite proposal. Um, yeah, but with that, I think we're good to go. For now, uh, we invite you all for a coffee break. Uh, enjoy some snacks, coffee, and share your insights about the first round. Think about the Public Choice Award. And to start in, the starting time for the second round uh, will be uh, around uh, 10.40, so please be back around 10.35. Uh, thank you all, and see you all after the break. Welcome back uh, for the second semi-final of today. I'm Amber from the Futuro team, and I'll be moderating this semi-final together with Camille. So the same rules apply as in the first semi-final. You, you will have eight minutes to present, and then you, have, you will have five minutes for questions. We will show you a yellow card when you have two minutes left, and a red card when you need to wrap up. Uh, if you have any questions, Kira, here will be your point of contact. Do not hesitate to reach out to her. 
Now we would like to introduce the judges who are policy fellows at the Jack Delors Center of this round. So we have Dr. Chu Nien, Luca Rasha, and Yannick Janssen. Please give them a warm welcome. So we now have the pleasure to listen to the fifth semi-finalist team um, of the future EU competition, team 75. I would like to invite Clémence from Sciences Po Paris and Corentin from Bocconi University to please take the stand and start uh, their presentation. Dear jury, dear colleagues, uh, thank you for being here with us today and we will present to you uh, Fighting Fire with Fire, uh, the future of geoengineering in the European Union. So, in the 14th century, um, between the 14th and the 19th century, uh, the average temperature of the Earth cooled by between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 degrees Celsius. This is known as the Little Ice Age, and it was in part caused by the eruption of, the, of a volcano named Salamas, which was one of the biggest explosions in history, and led to the decrease in temperature. As of today, we are able to replicate this effect of, on, on the temperature of the Earth. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Well, maybe it is. This is a subset of what is known as geoengineering. So what it is geoengineering? Geoengineering is a set of techniques that we can use to mitigate uh, the, climate sh the effect of climate change by modifying Earth's, uh, Earth's system. For example, the oceans or the atmosphere. This can go from very simple, very mundane techniques, such as planting trees to sequester carbon, to very far-fetched and science fiction ideas, such as releasing gases in the atmosphere with planes or spreading iron in the ocean. A good geoengineering project is one that has four main criteria. First of all, it is safe. Previous attempts at small-scale geoengineering have had devastating consequences. For example, the spreading of iron in the ocean led to toxic algae blooms forming. Second of all, it is affordable. This is one of the main strengths of geoengineering. Some advocates for climate um, uh, engineering have calculated that you can solve the main effects of climate change using sulfur dioxide release for less than a billion dollars, which is almost nothing compared to what we are currently spending today to fight climate change, and absolutely ridiculous compared to the total cost of climate change. It is obviously also effective and finally timely. The climate change is a crisis and we do not have time to wait for the effects. To... Geoengineering is a valuable tool both today and tomorrow. Today, for two reasons. A, it can already help us to mitigate the effects of climate change. And more importantly, it can prevent feedback loops from starting. Feedback loops is what makes climate change so, danger so dangerous. It's what happens when the consequence of climate change makes climate change even worse. For example, the ice caps melting means that the Earth's albedo gets lower, uh, gets lower, so we reflect less light, and hence the Earth heats up even more, thus accelerating even more climate change. And tomorrow, it might be even more valuable. It can be used as a last-ditch resort, but as mentioned previously, it can be very unsafe. And since in the, last, in the scenario where we would have to use the engineering as a um, last move, the environment would probably already be in crisis and would not be able to handle a mis, uh, mis, um, um, uh, uh, geoengineering project that is not correctly done. Second of all, there is the risk of rock geoengineering. It is a very credible risk that is ever increasing. Some nations' existence or revenue depend on, uh, are threatened by climate change, for example, Pacific Islands or petrostates, and some companies absolutely do not wish for climate change to continue, for example, um, car manufacturers. And as of today, there is basically no regulation preventing them uh, effectively from engaging themselves in geoengineering in what might be a very unsafe way. Furthermore, geoengineering is easy to do, 
as mentioned previously, it can be very cheap, but very hard to detect. If we don't put anything in place, it might take us up to 14 years to detect the, release of the re massive release of sulfate dioxide in the atmosphere, which would uh, then not be possible to stop anymore due to the risk of termination shock. Essentially, we might be trapped because a few lone actors decide to engage in, ge in rogue geoengineering. So, what should we do? Um, so we propose the creation of a European geoengineering uh, research community which would work around three main axes, the first being to develop research, the second being to ensure safety, and the third being to su supervise projects. Uh, so first, develop research. Um, we would do this by, one, facilitating loans by the European Investment Bank, as well as encouraging private uh, investment in geoengineering, especially in, cap uh, in carbon capture projects. Um, we would also want to increase research uh, and we would finance that by uh, the multi-annual uh, framework programs. Uh, so we would want uh, an increase, a 30% increase in geoengineering uh, projects, research projects financed by uh, the multi-annual framework programs uh, 10. Um, the financing will depend, the amount of financing will depend on the state of geoengineering research in uh, the country. So if the country is, um, has currently a lot of free geoengineering programs, the maximum of the financing will be set at 30%. If it has little to almost no geoengineering program, the maximum will be set at 70%. Um, to assess the category in which the country uh, will find itself, we will base ourselves on the annual uh, share of GDP going into research as well as uh, the number of geoengineering uh, projects undertaken in the country. Uh, the second uh, axis being to ensure safety. For that, we would create a European Geoengineering Security Council, which would be made out of uh, two scientists per signatory country and three legal practitioners. So two scientists would be uh, sort of freely selected by uh, the signatory country, uh, and the three legal practitioners would be uh, nominated by uh, the European Geoengineering Research Community. Every four years, one third of the council would be renovated and no individual can sit for more than eight years to ensure both continuity and novelty in the council. Um, so what can the council do? Concerning a geoengineering research project, it can uh, block EU funding or suspend the project with uh, a simple majority vote. And concerning geoengineering like programs launch, it can either suspend uh, fully stop and decide the launch of a project, but for that it needs a qualified majority of 60%. Finally, when it comes to uh, supervising projects, this would be done through a binding legal framework around uh, three main principles. One, the precautionary principle, two, the principle of international conversation, and uh, finally, it must be uh, legally binding. Concerning the precautionary principle, um, it is the idea that no country or group of country can launch geoengineering projects unless there exists a solid basis proving its harmlessness, because as Corentin said, uh, rogue geoengineering could potentially be very dangerous. International conversation. Um, so it would need, we would need discussion between countries when there is talk about maybe launching a geoengineering project because it will affect the countries around it as we are talking about changing uh, climate and the weather. Uh, if no agreement is reached within six months, the, referred, the matter is referred to uh, the European Geoengineering Security Council that will decide. Uh, finally, it must be legally binding and uh, the offenders uh, will pay reparations to the countries um, to the countries that are affected in case they launch a geoengineering program without, uh, concert without concerting with, the council, with um, countries or without agreement uh, by the Council. Uh, the amount of reparation will be uh, decided by the, uh, the European Court of Justice. Um, so to conclude, obviously geoengineering is something that is extremely uh, controversial and uh, it is only a last resort um, program. However, we need to investigate more into it to uh, see how and why we why it should be done. Thank you. Well, 
Um, thank you very much for your very interesting um, presentation. My, the first question I had relates to the idea of the council that you just presented. Um, you said as a potential sanction it could block funding to companies, but um, how would you go about companies that do not rely on EU funding, so where there's no possibility of, of blocking EU funding, for example? Um, well, the, so the RISA, the uh, European Security Council, uh, mainly uh, focuses on um, research uh, projects and programs. Programs are most often launched by states. Recently, there has been um, a, re a geoengineering um, uh, program, but it was launched by uh, the United States. It's not generally launched by an individual company because something of such a large scale is so costly that it usually cannot be done by a company. Um, the projects that are usually uh, undertaken by companies are carbon, um, are, uh, carbon captures projects that we do encourage. Uh, in case, in the unlikely case, I guess, that a company would uh, undertake a geoengineering um, project that could potentially have like the scale enough to be harmful, uh, I guess it would uh, be a matter of uh, the European Court of Justice since it would not have respected the, the rule and the regulations. Um, thank you very much for, for the presentation for this policy brief. I think it's a very interesting topic and you presented it very well. I have made one comment and two small questions. One comment is about the funding and the financing. You want to finance it with Next Generation EU, but of course that runs out in 2026. So there's a very short time frame uh, with, uh, you're working with in terms of financing. Two questions um, that are quite a bit related. Um, and, and they relate to the fact that you want to do this at EU level and make it legally binding. And the first question is, does the EU have the competence to do this? Can the EU make this legally binding? Uh, and the second question is, what is the added benefit of doing this at the European level? Why should the EU do it instead of the national level or maybe even a global level if it's a, it's a, if it's a global problem? Um, so just to start with the second question on why uh, the EU should do it, uh, obviously, at the national level, the risk is a uh, sole nation decided to do, deciding to do something that will have an effect on both its neighbouring countries and even on the world if it's uh, if, uh, scaled large enough. We would, of course, uh, like to do it at an international level uh, with the United Nations. Of course, the more participant you have, the harder it is. Uh, so for the moment, we would like to start by the European Union and potentially uh, go wider uh, afterwards, but for the moment, we are starting to do it at an international, but maybe a smaller scale. Um, on the um, on the if the EU can make it legally binding, we would need to have a new. I guess uh, it's not EU. It it would be in link with European Union, but it would be a new um, a new like. Um, a new accord like people would have to sign. So it's not EU, you know, like the EU countries would have to sign, but some, of course, may decide not to sign it, which is, of course, a challenge of this project. Okay, final comment from my side. Thanks a lot for the interesting presentation. Um, uh, to my understanding, there's a broad range of different kind of geoengineering techniques. So how would you decide on the allocation of funding between these different techniques and how would you incorporate the associated societal risks of these projects in the decision making process? Okay, so regarding which uh, techniques to invest into, there, it's true that there is a lot of techniques that are suggested. Um, however, we, can al we already know that a few of them are credible and possible and might be effective, whereas a lot of them are just proposed as more start experiments or creative ideas and actual policies. Uh, I don't have the skills to know which one we should invest into, so I think the council that uh, Clemence suggested and the scientists that are part of it should be the one bearing responsibility for it, that uh, are the one who has the skill and knowledge to do this. And could you repeat the second part of your question? I'm not sure I understood what you mean fully. Um, how you would 
um, the, I mean, there are different so societal risks associated with the, the variety of these geoengineering techniques. And if you're based at all on the research committee, would these societal risks also be incorporated in the decision-making process? Okay, so I, I think I see what you mean. Um, so first off, regarding the social to risk, I think what we need to remember is that we already have a social to risk, and that's climate change. And uh, making the choice to try and fight it, uh, and, or making the choice to not fight it, is in itself a social choice, and not, um, not just refusing to act as a neutral, uh, it's not a neutral policy. Choosing not to act and not to do geoengineering should be an active choice. Uh, however, I do, uh, I do think that uh, the people would have some control still over whether or not, first off, uh, since, as Clemence mentioned, uh, the country would have to sign it. If, the, if it's not a popular uh, decision amongst the countrymen, we can imagine that leaders would not design, de decide to sign, the, to sign into the council. So there would be this level of, um, of representation of the population. has said it all uh, and once again we'd like to emphasize that um, as he said on the risk of geoengineering for the moment it's makes me a last resort it's just that if things keep going on we may need that extra short time that it might buy us and it's not we don't necessarily seek to implement it as a way to solve climate change because there is obviously very um, very harsh uh, risks, and in general, uh, it is not something that is sustainable for a very long time. Thank you to Team 75. Uh, we then proceed to the sixth semi-finalist team. I invite to the stage Team 53 with Simone, Luca, and Georgia from Bocconi University and the Hurti School to present their pejonierity. Good morning, everyone. We are Group 53, and today we are going to present our proposal called A Night Train Named Desire. Um, first of all, um, why is it important now? In 2020, the European countries signed the European Green New Deal with the aim of reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. As we can see from the graph, almost all sectors are on track, except for the mobility sector, which is still lagging behind and whose um, emissions, greenhouse gases emissions, are increasing since the 90s. Aviation, in particular, is responsible for 13% of the total EU emissions, uh, with the largest uh, per passenger kilometer emissions, while the most environmentally friendly mode of transport are trains, which are responsible only for 0.4% of the total emissions. But why night trains? This is a neglected transport modality that could actually attract attract a lot of air travelers. Um, in fact, most of the, the most frequented flights in Europe work on short distances, uh, on short distances, in most cases lower than 1,000 kilometers. For that reason, night trains could, could substitute those routes. Um, but which are the advantages of night trains compared to planes? First of all, the fact that you can arrive at your destination well rested and you can arrive in the city center so you, you don't have to spend time and money going from the, the airport to the city center. Another advantage is that not, uh, trains are more flexible, meaning that they can connect different important cities while planes only connect to uh, points in space. Of course, Travel time would be longer for night trains, but this is uh, needed in, or in order to have a restful night of sleep. So how can we really attract people towards choosing night trains instead of airplanes? Well, we have to focus on three main criteria according to studies. The first one is travel time. The ideal night train should cover a distance between 640 kilometers and 1,120 in order to allow its passengers to have a restful night. And of course, departure and arrival time are also very important as the ideal night train should um, depart at about 7 to 11 p.m. and should arrive at its destination at about 7 to 
to 9 a.m. in the following morning. And then, of course, uh, comfort is another criterion, comfort levels, as studies have shown that uh, higher comfort levels actually help bring, in, help bring down the uh, perceived effect of travel time on passengers. And so train companies should actually focus on that and invest on that if they want to uh, boost attractiveness. And, uh, but actually, even more important than comfort levels, uh, we have privacy aspects. As studies have shown that people prefer taking night trains with no amenities, uh, but with compartments of about two people, rather than taking night trains with amenities such as food and beverages, but with compartments of six or more people. After all, no one really wants to be stranded with strangers on a train, as Director Alfred Hitchcock also illustrated, but still. And the third most important um, criterion would be price, as it is the main factor because of which today people actually tend to choose low-cost airlines instead of night trains. And so this is exactly what we're focusing on in our proposal. Our proposal basically consists of a five-year 30% uh, cashback plan on the purchase of night train tickets, like the Italian cashback di Stato. And uh, basically we are working on lowering prices in order to boost demand and incentivize attractiveness um, for, for, for passengers. We also believe in the efficacy of uh, randomized prices. So basically each user will compete in a Europe-wide lottery and for every 10 million transactions the lucky winner will be given with uh, 1,500 euros. And also our plan will be 100% digital since uh, users will have to upload the QR code uh, of their tickets alongside their bank account details on a digital platform and their cashback will come only after the uh, trip has taken place. And, but we really believe that one of the main strengths of our program is basically that it works on existing infrastructure. Out of the 71 most popular air routes all over Europe, Europe-wide, 39 of them already have come comparable existing rail infrastructure, which means that it could be used instead of taking airplanes. And out of these 39, 22 of them already have night train services. So once again, our proposal focuses on lowering prices to boost demand and incentivize the usage of night trains. So as for the financial feasibility, our project is relatively cheap through an estimate of the average capacity of a line and the average price of a ticket, which is actually really volatile. We estimated the total annual expenditures to be around 95 million euros if all the lines were to be used properly. And an additional cost would then be the uh, implementation and management of the digital platform. To cover for these expenditures, we could apply for the Connecting Europe Facility Fund, which aims exactly at reducing emission in the transport sector. So if nitrogen were to be used at their fullest potential, they could shift up to 32% of the airplane passengers and save up to 3% of the total greenhouse gases emission Europe-wide. Another important aspect would be the collaboration and the partnership with the private and national train companies. And this would be um, if, uh, fundamental for two main reasons. The first one is in order to deal with the technical aspects of the tickets, such as refunds, reimbursements, etc., we would need a continuous dialogue between EU and uh, uh, the private and national train companies. Second of all, uh, once the five-year plan is over, the private companies will uh, be fundamental in communicating passenger data in order uh, to evaluate our policies, not only based on the cashback results that we can see. So, however, um, our policy proposal is just the first step in towards the establishment of NITRO as a common transport modality. And if we wish to continue on this path, uh, future infrastructure investments will definitely be needed. First of all, by increasing the number of lines uh, that are served by nitrogen services from 22 to 39, where the infrastructure already exists, and increasing the number of trips taken on those lines following the arrival and departure time that we suggested, since today they do not follow those uh, requirements. Third, we should provide incentive to private and national train companies to increase and upgrade their night trains in terms of comfort and activities that can be done on board in order to reduce the perceived travel time. Then, one of the most important aspects that needs to be addressed is the creation of a common European platform for the purchase of tickets. As today, uh, for a trip, you have to book different tickets from different platforms. And this will be, would uh, enable for an easier tracking and also an easier implementation of future uh, possible cashback initiatives. Finally, we would need a substantial increase in the number of cross-border connection, and this would be useful not only for nitrous, but for freight trains and trains in general. So we probably know one of your questions would be if we did come here with a night train or not. 
but unfortunately the answer is no. Uh, but hopefully one day we'll be able to come back and for sure we will be better rested than we are today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again uh, for that very interesting presentation. You were actually right, that was one of our questions we thought of. <laughs> Um, okay, but more on the topic. Um, you said that prices are very volatile. Mm -hmm. So will this 30% cashback really bring them on par with like cheap airlines prices? And another factor is, is the excess existing wagons or like the existing night trains? You, because you mentioned non-monetary factors play an essential role as well. And so far, like they use a lot of older trains as well to um, keep it operating. Um, so the comfort factor, is there a way to offset that in the short time as well? So it would be um, not in the immediate, in the short immediate time, but once uh, we think that once private train companies see that the uh, demand is stimulated, you have an increase in uh, uh, purchases of tickets, then this will spur the, uh, also for them uh, the need for an upgrade of their train. Uh, since. As of right now, yeah, it is. they are not that comfortable and the requirements, the, at least the, the scientific findings in order for make the, making the train viable uh, between, the play, uh, between the choice between plane and uh, uh, trains are not yet followed. So we would need, uh, um, I think, an, uh, a really strong advertising coming from Europe towards these uh, uh, private national train companies to make them realize that this is a niche market that is not exploited yet. So this would be very interesting also for them because obviously they, they would make profit off of it. So I think this is, w would be just a consequence of our uh, implementation of our policy. Um, thank you very much for this presentation and um, the very, very nice title actually of your, your train. We liked it a lot. Um, I have a question with the very last ones of your recommendations because if I think about taking a night train, it's of, it's, it, it is about comfort, it is about prices, but often it is about there's no connection, right? So you did mention it that that is the fifth step that um, you would like to take, I think, or what was so, it? But shouldn't, isn't that the main problem of night trains, that there are no tracks and no connections to be taken? So as of right now, there are 22 working connections that connect most of the important cities, and we, wish, we want to work uh, on that on the short term. Uh, because obviously building infrastructure such as railways takes an incredible long time. So we want to uh, start uh, uh, adjusting the trips taken on those lines following these uh, uh, requirements that we uh, provided. And uh, seeing that, we believe that, uh, as we said, uh, this will spur the also the supply side. But obviously, if we see that uh, the 22 lines are working, then we will can uh, uh, upgrade and uh, make the other, uh, the. 39 lines work all together. This would be already a, a great uh, um, substitution in the um, number of uh, uh, airplane travelers that choose to go with night trains. So we believe that already with 39 working lines, that would be uh, already a huge accomplishment in terms of uh, um, reducing emission coming from airplanes. Um, yes, exactly. And then after these 39 um, um, network uh, rail, rail lines basically uh, we believe that also private companies will actually kind of like um, also uh, play a role in the in, in the building of, of, of new networks just because uh, if they see that people want night trains they are going to actually advocate for that so two follow-up questions on these is there research that says when if trains are more comfortable people would actually switch despite the the longer time they would need and secondly is the research that companies would invest in more railroads if there was more demand so there there, there are actually studies uh, from one from Curtale in uh, 2023 pretty recent that stated that uh, um, uh, an increased comfort level and uh, uh, mostly uh, an increase in the activities that can be done on board the train uh, the perceived travel time will uh, uh, decrease a lot and um, 
uh, on this uh, second question instead, uh, we, there, are, there is no reason uh, on the fact that uh, um, private companies will follow these uh, uh, suggestions that we provided. But uh, uh, Europe stresses this, has already stressed this in 2020 with the uh, project of re uh, main project on the re revitalization of night trains. Uh, they are already started testing this uh, theory and uh, they, in 2021 they um, promoted the year of rail. So there is a, uh, also a, um, uh, an interest coming from Europe towards the revitalization of this uh, uh, transport modality. And, and, and many many actually of our proposals that, that we said uh, are actually kind of like complementary to what Europe said in the, in, in the study, in 2020 study. Yeah, thank you, maybe as a, a short last uh, question. Um, personally, I would really like your um, project to work, um, but I was wondering whether you have looked at the capacity of the 22 or 39 lines at the moment, because again, this is just uh, anecdotal evidence, but it's really hard to book night trains uh, on a short time frame, you know, and if you have to book your holidays, I don't know, half a year in advance, I think that makes it less um, yeah. attractive. So have you sort of checked the capacity, whether these lines can actually host your so, system? Yeah. The estimated capacity of a line comes from a study from Savel, Sav, Savelberg in 2019 that estimated uh, those 22 lines to be, um, to have a capacity of 90,000 90, people uh, for um, trip, so 90,000 and 90,000. So the estimated overall capacity is half, obviously, because there's fluctuations in demand, different periods where people use it more or less. And uh, as of right now, uh, the uh, night train services is used for, uh, in, on average, uh, for 6 million European every year. And uh, those lines can support uh, an increase because uh, the um, the uh, capacity right now is not obviously uh, used, the, the capacity of a train is not used yet, so there is space for uh, an increase in the number of uh, passengers, for sure. Thank you, Team 53. I now invite Team 17, Eman and Francois, from Bocconi University. CBAM is a mechanism that was developed with very little interaction with developing countries. Their interests play a very little role in the CBAM and its design. Dear future EU Jury Committee, the audience, it's an honor to be here. My name is Francois Praum. And I'm Iman. Today we're going to talk about the climate divide and why the EU's board adjustment mechanism needs rethinking for developing countries. The proposal for the CBAM was put forward by the European Commission in July 2021. The CBAM is a unique tariff that imposes a carbon price on energy intensive imports equivalent to that imposed on domestic um, products through the emission trading scheme. The urgency of this matter is evident. Two days ago, the European Parliament adopted the CBAM, and already in October this year, the CBAM is set to begin its transitional phase. At first sight, the objectives of the CBAM seem quite promising. First, to level the playing field between European companies and importers and to avoid carbon leakage, that is, European carbon intensive companies relocating outside the European Union to avoid carbon pricing. The second incentive, or the second objective of the CBM is also quite promising because it incentivizes climate mitigation abroad through carbon pricing. Now, while we recognize that these are very important objectives, there is one glaring problem with the CBAM, which is precisely that it is not inclusive enough. The projected impact of the CBAM on developed versus developing countries is set to be vastly disproportional, as you can see in this graph here. With a CBAM of $44 per ton of carbon, developing countries will actually witness a decrease in income levels of $6 billion, while developed countries will witness an increase of income levels by $2.5 billion. These findings should cause significant concern. But why exactly are developing countries set to be hit so harshly? Well, for three main reasons. Firstly, developing countries tend to have more carbon-intensive production methods, which means that they will essentially fare higher tariffs. Secondly, developing countries tend to be more vulnerable to, um, to the CBAM because of the fact that they have a less diversified export structure, meaning that it will be difficult for them to switch away from the target sectors of the CBAM. 
Finally, developing countries are also more exposed to the CBAM than developed countries because of the fact that they have an asymmetric trade relationship with the EU, whereby the EU is a major trading partner for them and they can't find it easy to switch to other trading partners. But let's put these findings in a more realistic scenario, right? Let's take the case of Mozambique. Mozambique is one of the 46 least developed countries in the world. Not only that, it is the fifth most climate vulnerable, it was the fifth most climate vulnerable country between 2000 and 2019, despite the fact that it has contributed negligibly to climate global emissions. Finally, it is the country that is said to be most impacted by the CBAM, with both the highest level of vulnerability and the highest level of exposure to it. Unfortunately, Mozambique is not alone. There are many developing countries out there, largely in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, that have both high levels of vulnerability and exposure to the CBAM. To expect these countries to pay the same tariff, at, despite the fact that they have contributed very little to global emissions, as uh, far more advanced uh, economies will pay, is simply unjust. However, it's not just developing countries that stand to lose. Indeed, the EU could really shoot itself in the foot here. First, because the CBAM targets countries that lie in regions of geostrategic importance. With the CBAM, the long-term soft power of the EU, such as in the Middle East, but also North Africa, is at stake. Second, the CBAM could undermine the EU's climate mitigation leadership that the bloc demonstrated at the last conference of the parties. With the CBAM, the EU's credibility is also at stake. And finally, the CBAM targets countries that currently benefit from the EU's special treatment. That is, with the CBAM, the EU's de development agenda too is at stake. To measure the efficacy of our proposals, we came up with three criteria. First, responsibility, measured by the historic contributions to global emissions. This rule stems from the common but differentiated responsibilities principle of the United Nations and also derives from the WTO's principle of special and differential treatment. The second rule is capability, that is the ability to pay for mitigation. This means that any CBAM policy should reflect the targeted country's development status and preserve their right to development. And finally, mitigation impact. The idea that this NEC BEM policy should not undermine decarbonisation efforts or even increase the risk of carbon leakage. According to these criteria, our assessment is clear. The CBEM needs supplementary measures. First, because LDCs and SIDS are disproportionately affected in their welfare and development. And second of all, because this very disproportionate effect may exacerbate global inequalities. So how do we work towards creating a CBAM that meets its own policy objectives while also being inclusive? We recommend a three-pronged approach. Firstly, to grant exemptions to least developed countries and small island developing states. Secondly, to foster dialogue with these countries to ensure that their concerns are taken into account and that the exact nature of these exemptions, be they partial, transitory or complete, be determined after this dialogue. Finally, we recommend that the revenues raised from this tariff should be financed towards uh, funding the low-carbon energy transition in these countries. Now, while we recognize that these policy solutions meet our first two criteria of responsibility and capability, we do see that there's a risk with meeting the third criterion, which is mitigation impact. It could be argued that giving exemptions to these countries would raise the risk of, climate, um, of carbon leakage and also disincentivize these countries from decarbonizing. So how do we meet these risks? Firstly, with regards to carbon leakage, we recommend firstly that the EU uh, put in place rule of origins regulations to ensure that other countries don't redirect their goods to these exempted countries and thereby not face the tariff. And secondly, we recommend that safeguards be put into place for domestic companies that would kick into place in the case that, for example, there's a direct link established between these exemptions and carbon leakage. As regards the risk of disincentivizing these countries from decarbonizing, we believe our third solution, which is financing, would meet this risk, if, especially if the EU uses these funds to directly funds, finance the low-carbon energy transition in these countries. In fact, research finds that this would not only be affordable for EU countries, but also welfare improving for these countries. So how can we operationalize our proposals? Given that the legislative process of the CBEM is ongoing, comitology will be decisive in adjusting the CBEM. Using Article 290 of the TFEU, the Commission may propose a delegated act introducing these amendments and additions to the CBAM proposal, which must then be approved by country representatives. As for exemptions, these would only add consistency, coherency to the EU's development agenda, because indeed LDCs and lower to middle-income countries are already benefiting from a legal framework of positive discrimination. For example, with the everything but arms scheme, but also with the generalized scheme of preferences. 
As for dialogue, while establishing the design, the Commission can rely on the Global, Alliance, Global Climate Change Alliance Plus, which is a forum to discuss with LDCs and SITs and build on their capacity to sustain the CBAM. And finally, as for climate financing, the European Parliament has already advocated for a specialised treatment for developing countries and also indicated that the funds raised should be directed towards climate financing, for instance, with the fund of the European Green Deal. We firmly believe that a CBAM that is inclusive will equip the EU with the necessary political and diplomatic capital to accelerate climate mitigation internationally and place it at the forefront in the international fight against climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much for this um, very, very nice presentation and uh, on a very complicated topic. I actually have a question um, about the slide right here. So I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with the legislative process of CBAM, but you say it's still in the legislative process, not adopted yet. Then why use Article 290 to do this? Why not go into the legislative, legislative procedure itself? Because also, of course, the, I have several questions about the use of 290. So is there a legal basis in the proposal right now to use this? To, 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 to allow the Commission to um, use a delegated act? And secondly, would this qualify as simply amending the, the CBAM legislation or is this actually so far reaching that it should be introduced in legislation itself? So why the use of Article 290 in this case? Right, so regarding the first question, which was about uh, why give the Commission the power to do this? Is that what it was? Well, very generally, why do you propose to do this via 290? And like, why do you propose the committology procedure for to implement your proposal as opposed to try to get it into the legislative process itself? Because this is not the legislative process, huh? Right. So the reason why we recommended that is because the comitology procedure is specifically geared towards coming up with the specific implementing measures required to implement a policy. So, for example, the CBAM. And it, uh, the commission would be tasked with coming up with this comitology committee that would then recommend these implementing measures, right? And we believe that this is um, the reason why we would recommend a comitology committee, particularly for this purpose, is because a lot of these things have been discussed in the legislative procedure. So the European Parliament has commented on this. Um, and uh, the only body essentially that is left to actually uh, adopt this act is the Council. Um, so for the legislative procedure is largely complete. And we are not sure if we will see these uh, amendments actually uh, be part of them, since there's only one body left to adopt them. Thus, we would recommend that the Commission would go ahead and um, set up this comitology committee for this purpose. And um, yeah. If I may add on to that, we conducted primary research with Professor Luca Taschini, who reassured us that comitology indeed will be indeed be decisive because usually the parliament and also uh, bodies of the legislative branch will discuss on the general principles that are certainly set, but the, the technical details, which really rely on the everything but arms scheme and, and the Global Climate Change Alliance, this is the decisive aspect for developing countries that we have not seen yet being implemented so far because it is a very technical matter. But financing is not an implementation aspect. It's the it's the core of the legisl of your idea. You can't actually deal with the financing in the delegated act. That is no longer amending or or, or supplementing or implementing the the legislative act. And you need a legal basis huh, in the mother act in order to use a delegated act. Right, so another reason why is because uh, all of the so sort of proposals that have been passed regarding the CBAM in the, uh, in the legislative process so far have been relatively shielded from public eyes. So we're not entirely sure where the, leg like the legal uh, base, like the support for these mechanisms are at this point. But the thing is that the European Parliament has discussed it. And so we believe that it is likely that financing is going to be included uh, since the European Parliament has publicly advocated that the CBAM's revenues should be geared for this particular purpose. We're not sure if it has, which is why we would recommend the Comitology Committee um, to just review that and make their recommendations. Yeah, um, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting um, presentation. I think you highlight a very, very relevant point there. Um, you mentioned in one of the risks for the EU itself that it could sort of undermine or jeopardize uh, the EU's sort of geostrategic ambition. Could you elaborate on that maybe a bit? How do you perceive that? 
Um, yes, uh, so we could maybe go back to the slide. Um, the general idea is that um, the EU is interested in um, maintaining its climate action leadership. We have seen the last conference of parties the idea to set up a loss and damage fund, for instance, which really shows that the EU is interested in the interaction in climate mitigation with developing countries. Now, imposing a CBAM on countries that are not responsible for the climate crisis really undermines this very leadership. And, and especially in regions of strategic importance, I think that is something we need to emphasize, um, especially um, regarding the unanimous proposals that are often you know, implemented at the supranational level, at an international level, which, where political capital is very much needed. And losing this political capital would essentially hurt the climate, and that's, that's the very idea of it. And it would also be somewhat misaligned with what the EU has stated at these international conferences, at the COP, at where it's publicly you know, advocated for this loss and damage fund to go through, where it has this, when it has this very you know, uh, important development agenda and this already existing scheme of preferences for these countries. So it would be somewhat, we believe, misaligned with the interests and the priorities that the EU gives already to these countries. Um, thanks again also from my side. I think you're highlighting a very relevant uh, aspect here. Um, if it comes to the exemptions you want to grant for LDCs, how exactly would you decide which LDC gets, is it like based on the GDP or what are the criteria you would base these uh, decisions on? So the United Nations has a list of 46 LDCs, um, so we would certainly rely on that um, to also be in line with the multilateral kind of approach that we're taking. Um, and this comprises many aspects, GDP, but also the Human Development Index, um, which then results in the classification as an LDC. This, is, this list is updated regularly, of course. And also, I think the second point here is really important, the dialogue aspect, which is essentially to understand more the concerns of these countries, but also to figure out their economic context and how affected by the CBAM they will be. Obviously, if they have a high level of vulnerability and exposure to the CBAM, the, we would recommend the granting of these exemptions, but that requires a more thorough understanding of their specific context and how much they're going to be impacted by the CBAM. Thank you. And when it, when it comes to the financing, um, so you're proposing to, to redirect the whole the total revenues to, to these countries. Um, how would you say is that, is it politically feasible to actually achieve that? Well, it lies in the EU's own interest, that was just trying to underline, it lies in the EU's own interest to be a leader, a diplomatic leader internationally. And in order to build this political capital, we believe that this is a necessary step um, because it is about taking on responsibility that many countries have not yet desired to take. Um, and this is a very innovative approach in a sense. And again, the parliament did say exactly that, that the, all of the revenues from the CBAM should be targeted towards financing the low carbon transition in developing uh, for climate financing purposes, essentially. Um, also, um, it's important to consider the multilateral aspect here since the EU has already agreed to the loss and damage fund, right? So it would also kind of fall under the EU's international commitments and these funds that are used for climate financing could make up some part of the international commitments that the EU has made. So already the EU does have to provide climate financing in the near future to these countries and this would make up for part of it. Thank you all. And finally, last but not least, we now pre proceed with the eighth uh, semi-final team. Uh, I invite two students from Bogoni and Herti, Team 44, Iris and uh, Federica, to present their idea. Thank you. So uh, nowadays there are people who are already um, suffering the most from the consequences of climate change. And we are here to prove you that without gender equality there is no possibility for climate justice. And uh, without including women's perspective, there is um, the implementation of long-lasting and resilient policies in order to fight um, climate change is impossible to be obtained. obtained. So uh, we believe that the gender gap in least developed countries um, gives us a window of opportunity in which by including women perspective we can have a crucial link in order to achieve sustainable development, progress and social equity. So uh, we truly believe that only with the um, European-African Union partnership we can uh, implement uh, the education of uh, women in least developed countries. So, um, the most majority of least, of least developed countries are present in Africa, and they are the ones who are most disproportionately affected by climate change. So, firstly, due to their geographic location and their highly dependence on natural resources, we believe that they are facing now a global triple crisis on uh, climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. 
Uh, moreover, the uh, social and economic consequences of the pandemic do not, not only push countries into a recession, but also reverse several years of development. And as it wasn't enough, the um, consequences consequences of the, war, uh, of the war in uh, Ukraine also um, increase this gap. So by now it should be clear the urgency of uh, ensuring a healthy environment for all, especially for uh, the most vulnerable ones. Uh, so we believe that, um, I mean, in absolute terms, the women are the ones who are mostly affected by climate change. And the roots of this uh, problem is based on the patriarchal, patriarchal African societies and that leads to unequal access to education and then unequal access to job opportunities. And all of these factors make women be the most employed in the agriculture sector that is the one mostly affected by climate change. And all of this, um, this proportion and responsibility that women have in order to ensure um, resources and income to their families make uh, young girls um, feeling this pressure and um, leading to uh, a lot of school drops. So this uh, is the reason why they are most vulnerable and this is why there is a huge increase of the burden of um, gender gap in education. So by now it should be clear that there are two major goals that need to be addressed. On one hand, it is fundamental to ensure a clean, healthy and sustainable environment that is it, uh, it is recognized as a human right. And also, um, the gender equality is not only uh, the fairest thing to achieve, but we still have to see the untapped potential that including women's perspective in climate-related issues can uh, give. So um, the ambition of our policy proposal is to shift women's position from being a uh, victim of climate change to be active agents in order to fight it. And we want to leverage on two main uh, points that are the knowledge of the environmental and local biodiversity that um, history uh, ages of uh, them being the uh, actual employers of the agriculture sector have given and also the different environmental sensibilities and priorities that they have um, compared to men as previously presented. So due to the shared uh, interest and needs, the geographical uh, proximity and the interdependence, we strongly believe that the key enable of our policy proposal is the partnership with the, between the European Union and the African Union. However, for this partnership to be truly valuable, it is important that these two actors speak as partners with a common voice, with no hierarchical roles. Having this clear in mind, uh, we are here to, to state that uh, this partnership should be redefined with uh, a particular attention on empowering, empowering women and girls through education, through education, with a special attention on the development of green skills and green cap capabilities. The, what we want to achieve through this redesign of the partnership is, first of all, to include women's perspective in decision-making and policy-making uh, process, especially on environmental aspects. But secondly, and most importantly, we also want to tackle the patriarchal social norms of the African society. Uh, by now, you, you may be wondering, so why do you should intervene in the African context? Two main answers for that. First of all, the, global crisis, the climate crisis is a global crisis that requires a global response. But secondly, um, there is also the moral need for the global north to help the global south uh, to overcome the challenges of global warming to which in reality they contributed uh, the least. Uh, we see many strengths uh, in, uh, in this partnership, um, just to, to mention some. It is a continent-to-continent -continent relationship. It is a bottom-up approach because we want to empower people by uh, leveraging on education. It is context-specific. It is people-centered because we not only focus on the uh, vulnerabilities of people, but we, we also see uh, women as the main driver for change. It is a multidimensional approach because we want to address two challenges challenges with one holistic response. Um, and uh, here we just wanted to elaborate more about why should we start from the education of women. And there are several reasons why girls' education can actually reduce carbon emissions. But just to mention some, uh, here uh, we have stated the fact that uh, um, uh, girls' education can truly increase the participation of women in the decision-making process, making it benefit from the diverse point of view of, and experiences of women. Uh, at the same time, it can also encourage 
the uh, transition towards green skills and a green job. Uh, most importantly, when education is also, um, um, it's also about sexual and reproductive health, it can also has an impact on, um, for instance, uh, uh, population growth and urbanization uh, um, level, uh, which in the end has have an impact on uh, greenhouse gas emission. Uh, we do know that uh, there is no, uh, no ambitious project that, that comes without uh, shortcomings. And in this case, with whole likelihood, the EU would face some criticism such as, okay, so why should we focus on uh, Africa when there is still a lot of things to do in Europe? Or why should we care about gender equality when the focus is on uh, in environment? But these, these are all political uh, debate aspects that can be quite easily overcome. The major weaknesses of this policy is that it tackles the patriarchal structure of the African society. And we know that changing culture, it's extremely difficult and it takes time. But this is not a reason why we should give up on the project since the very beginning. In fact, if we are here today, it's because we strongly believe that for the EU, there is a window of opportunity to, ta to build uh, a climate, climate resilient uh, economies so with one holistic uh, solution that answered both the burden of building a more sustainable environment with also the necessity to promote gender equality. And here we are promoting a long-term perspective because we want to uh, advance a structural and a cultural change and we want to make sure that the communities are resilient to, uh, to the climate change even in the future. To conclude, um, we also want to um, uh, point out that in, with this policy proposal, we are making gender equality, we, we are leveraging on gender equality to gain inefficiency because the literature scientifically proven that um, the, the policy making and policy decision process can really benefit from uh, the, diver the diversity of point of view, of um, the diversity of sensitiveness and experiences of women compared to men. Thank you, and we are here to have your questions. Thank you so much for this, and thank you for, for um, pointing out a very important topic and question. I must say I'm a bit unclear, to be honest, on what your exact policy proposal is. What are you suggesting the EU does concretely yeah. to, to, uh, well, to, to achieve the goals that you had on your last slide? Okay, so the, the main idea is that uh, um, the current partnership that uh, the EU has with the African Union um, um, has some points about uh, uh, promoting uh, environmental aspects and promoting gender equality, but there is no uh, point about uh, um, uh, advancing both uh, um, environmental aspects with gender lens. So our idea was to um, um, somehow to address this gap and to, um, to advance the, the fact that it is important also to include um, this aspect in the partnership. Um, in particular, then the, the partnership would um, advance uh, education in, uh, in Africa and uh, uh, promoting also a series of projects with the idea of uh, promoting green skills and uh, green technologies. And the, of course, like we didn't uh, um, provide specific project just because um, it depends on the context. So uh, considering the specific realities and the specific needs, then there are different. Um, yes, I understand that. But what you're describing is the goal, right? So what is your policy proposal to get to that goal beyond putting it in the partnership as a goal? You want to also talk about about what she already said, I wanted to add that um, we are also promoting um, a new leveraging of the partnership of the, that these two countries have. So, um, and that is, um, we believe, fundamental in order to uh, be more context specific because um, once you are feel empowered as, as the government of the, of the state, um, you can, I mean, you can see better which are the problems, which are, which are the numbers, which are the um, the, the the amounts of, of need that is that is required. And so, by redistributing the, the responsibility between the the European, um, I mean, the European Union and the African Union, that is also, um, I, I, we believe, that is also a fundamental tool. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think you did a 
sort of great job in, in highlighting the, the urgency of your topic. Um, I have two questions and slightly follow up on what Tut just said. Um, you sort of highlight the, the relevance of education, but I'm not sure that meets sort of the urgency of the challenge you're describing. So could you perhaps elaborate a bit on why education would be the right tool as compared to, for example, gender quotas? Uh, and then the second question I have is um, you reference sort of patriarchal structures on the African continent, but shouldn't we start with uh, the problem of including women in EU policies as well? And sort of how do you judge that and do you see sort of possibilities of, you know, yeah. uh, doing that? So when we were discussing how to structure this, um, of course there were different alternatives and uh, the reason why we decided to um, discuss uh, the education is simply because we wanted to promote a long-term perspective. Um, it is not the only way to go. Uh, there are different uh, alternatives that can be pursued and even in the short term there are uh, plenty of solution that can be advanced, um, but um, in this case we would just wanted to highlight uh, what is necessary to do uh, in the long term to uh, to really um, empower women and empower the community just to um, uh, to be truly able to be involved in the decision making process. Um, also because maybe right now without having the, um, uh, the real competencies and without having a real understanding of what's happening around, uh, it would be um, difficult to, to, to include them or maybe there would be some um, differentiation among women like uh, the, the one that could have access to education uh, compared with the one that uh, cannot. Uh, and so the idea was just to promote uh, equality on every level, so not only among men and women, but also among women. Also, because um, promote, starting from education is um, a requirement also, both for uh, tackling the culture of the, um, these, society, these societies and um, as well as um, for the gender quotas that you just mentioned, because, uh, I mean, the education policy is um, kind of, can be seen as, a, as gender free because uh, now the gap in education is 30% in least developed countries, but we are just promoting an equal access to education, unless the, the gender quotas is gender specific. So uh, we, it is proven that promoting policies that are um, I mean, f perceived as gender free, there um, is more probably the, probably the achievement of, of them in order to, um, in the future, uh, believe for, for a cultural change. Um, also, thanks from my side. I think you're highlighting a very important link here, and you did a great job in that. Um, I, I would be interested in, like, do you have any concrete measures in the scope of the education field you're mentioning? Like, what would be the lever you you want to use to actually increase the access to education? Yeah, maybe like uh, in terms of uh, KPIs in the, um, for each implementation project, there would be like a, a specific measure, measures just to see whether um, it like it is effective the access to education, like the hours spent uh, studying, or whether uh, students also have to work while uh, while studying. So um, like for each reality, I think that uh, there would be um, different. Uh, um, measure just to say to see whether the the project was effective or, or not thank you <laughs> okay so then that concludes the second semi final congratulations on all the semi finalists for your brilliant presentation and brilliant ideas for the future of EU climate policy. Uh, so we will now be sending the judges to a separate room to deliberate and take a decision on the second finalist team. So please give them a big round of applause. Yes, and in the meantime, we're going to ask you, the public, uh, for your favorite proposal uh, for the future of EU climate policy. So all semifinalists and Observer Track students, uh, we're going to ask you to vote for the Public Choice Award this year uh, through the Menti slide, which will be coming up soon. There you go. Uh, you have three minutes to vote. Uh, 
in the next slide, you'll find the names uh, for the title for each proposal. Um, and those who are online, I'm asking you to please uh, not vote. Uh, all teams also are, are asked not to vote for their own team uh, due to fairness. And we will announce the winning team after the finals. Yes. Does everyone has the code? Okay, so I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna just remind you of the teams and their topics. So first we had team 86 about the next generation agriculture. Uh, then we had team 59, leveraging public markets for sustainable growth. Then we had team 77, air justice, a social compass through climate turbulences. Then team 41, uh, about the four day work week in the EU. Then we, have, we had team 75, about geoengineering in the EU. Then team 53, uh, a train named Desire, about nitrates in the EU. Then team 17, about the EU's border adjustment mechanism. And finally, team 47, including women's voice and gender gap in education. So we'll, we'll close the mentee in like two minutes. Whenever you're done, please go and show you the snacks and uh, have some drinks. Okay, so you can take a like five minutes break and then the judges will come back and will announce the second semi-final winner. The
Welcome back uh, to all, to now the most awaited announcement uh, for semifinalist teams. I'm going to invite uh, Yannick Janssen and Lukas uh, Rasche to please um, come award the finalists. <laughs> Sorry. Drum roll, please. Okay, so we're going to start with the uh, semi-final A. Maybe to just say beforehand, we have been very impressed with the quality of the presentations in general, and we really liked your proposals. Um, it was a really tough decision for us to choose the final lists. So the winner of semi-final A is... Paper number 41, Saving the Planet on a Friday Off. Congratulations. We do also have feedback, but I, uh, given that the feedback is from the other group of judges and they've written down their notes uh, wherever group 41 is, I think it's easiest if I give it to you and we can briefly discuss it later. And now we come to the second finalist. And this is team number 17. It's the proposal on revising the CBAM. Thank you. And again, congratulations for the finalists. You made it. Uh, So we will now be concluding this second round of semi-final. We would like to thank Matt for the technicalities here. We would like to thank the judges. Uh, warm applause again to you. Again to you. Uh, and a huge congratulations on all the semi-finalists. We are really happy to, to have you here and to have listened to your brilliant ideas. Congratulations again. So that concludes the second semi-final. We stopped the live stream now. The live stream will, ba will be back at five for the final. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so thank you for joining us this morning.